Hi everybody, uh, and yet another very warm welcome to Skeptics in the Pub online. We are a group of people from Skeptics in the Pub groups all over the country who came together when lockdown started to start putting on weekly talks here online. And from the way it looks, things are going at the moment, you may be seeing quite a lot more of us into the future, which I think is good. So um, a few things about tonight. We are going to start with a talk for about 45 minutes, then we'll have a break for about 15 minutes, and then we'll meet up again for a Q&A, uh, which will go on half an hour, 45 minutes, that kind of timing. Um, you will be able to ask questions. I won't go over all the links now, but they will be posted by the moderators and they'll be on screen sometimes. You can also donate to help with our upkeep via PayPal and that link will be in it as well. Uh, anything else that you need to know, moderators will be putting on and off in the, uh, in the chat. So do keep an eye on it and uh, chat to your friends as well. So tonight, uh, really pleased, we've got a really exciting talk. We've got Kimberly Wilson coming to talk to us about how to build a healthy brain. Kimberly is a chartered psychologist. She has done research in a number of interesting areas. Uh, specifically, what I thought was interesting was her nutritional research, but you'll be hearing more about all sorts of it. Um, Kimberly is also a governor at the Tavistock Clinic and um, she reminded me that she was born the year I was training there, which was a little disconcerting. <laughs> um, uh, and others of you might recognise Kimberly because she was the very popular winner of the Bake Off a few years ago, uh, a multi-talented young woman. So please, everybody, put your hands together for a very warm Skeptics in the Pub welcome for Kimberly Wilson. Hi everybody, hi. Um, I should probably just pop in a very slight correction. I was a runner up and I don't want to take anything away from Francis. Um, so, but yes, I was there uh, on Bake Off making cakes a few years back. And since then, my work has really, really sat at the overlap between food psychology and lifestyle as an extension of that. So food as a kind of uh, central feature of the modifiable risk factors for mental health and, and brain health, and um, and then lifestyle as a as an outsider um, piece of that puzzle. So I want to talk to you today about really the brain and how the brain has been neglected, but in particular, why we don't have a public health campaign for the brain um, and the way that the brain has been neglected in more general conversations about health, even when we're talking about mental health. And I think it's high time that we paid a little bit of attention to the most important organ in the body. Um, so my discussion will go through some of the kind of getting to know your brain science uh, and also some of the interventions, some of the research and evidence behind things that are within our hands, some of the things that we have some power over in order to help a little bit, nudge us in the direction of a healthy brain. So without further ado, I will get going. And I will start with an apology, um, an apology on uh, behalf of psychology, psychiatry, mental health professionals, because we kind of took this guy's pronouncement um, pretty literally and kind of ran with it in the mental health uh, professions. The idea that the, the, the mind was separate and kind of ethereal and kind of spiritual, spiritual and separate from the rest of the body, so that essentially anything that happens neck up goes to psychiatry, and everything that happens neck down has, you know, a realm of different health perspectives and, and professionals that take that take care of it. But never the twain shall meet. There's a sense in which whatever happens in the brain has nothing to do with the rest of the body. And therefore, we can't really intervene with the brain in the same way that we can with the rest of the body. And that's one of the reasons that we don't take prevention seriously when it comes to the brain because we don't assume that there are any things, anything that we can do to influence uh, brain and mental health. That's completely wrong, of course, because the brain does not function in isolation. You're not a brain in a jar. Your body isn't just a kind of meat suit that carries the rest or carries your brain around. Um, of course, everything that happens in the brain is deeply interconnected with what happens in the body. Everything that you know about the world has come through your senses and therefore is absolutely reliant on the body. But also the brain has this huge 
oversized energetic demand for its size. So the brain takes up only about two or three percent of your overall body weight, but it uses up between 20 and 25 percent of your calories, of your energy requirement when the body is at rest. So it's working kind of 10 times uh, its relative size, um, the energy, the energy demand is about 10 times its relative size. And, and obviously that goes up when you're stressed or when you're working very hard, when you're revising, when you're studying, that sort of thing. So it has a huge energetic demand. It needs a constant stream of energy in the form of glucose, but it also has a huge nutrient demand. And one of the things we forget, for example, is that nutrients are cofactors for the things that we consider only to be of the mind. So things like B vitamins and magnesium are cofactors for serotonin and dopamine. Um, essential fats are required not just to make the brain, but also to allow it to function, to allow cells to fire. So I'll be talking a little bit more about that later on, but just to remind you that obviously the brain is deeply interconnected with the body and therefore what happens in the body bears a lot on the overall function and health of the brain. And then the same way that when we're thinking about the health of an organ or the dysfunction of, a, of an organ, say if we're thinking about the heart, we recognize that the heart needs a little bit of help and attention when something goes wrong with its functions, right? So we know that there might be disease or, or dysfunction in the heart when you have high blood pressure or you have palpitations, or you have breathlessness or pain in your chest. We recognize the symptoms or impairment in function as a sign of underlying disease or disorder. Um, we should be applying the same principle, I argue, to the brain, um, that we should be looking at the symptoms or signs of, of dysfunction as having a bearing on the underlying health of the organ. And it just so happens, though, that the functions of the brain are mood, focus, attention, decision-making, managing anxiety and that sort of thing. So we should, I think, be thinking much more in terms of how do the symptoms relate to the underlying structure and function of the organ on which they depend. Uh, but I will get more into that in a moment. First of all, I just want to talk about the scale of the problem. When I first put this talk together, I spoke about it being an urgent global health crisis. We have another one of those at the moment, but I still do think that this is, brain health is a major global health crisis. So when we think about the scale of the problem in young people, we know that after accident, suicide is the biggest killer of, of young people. Perhaps that's to be expected because they're not you know, getting diseases of lifestyle and, and age. But what is worrying, and, and I guess it's pertinent that today is World Suicide Prevention Day, what is pertinent is that the rates of suicide in young people aged 10 to 24 is increasing and is currently at a 19 year high as of the 2019 statistics. So something is getting worse in terms of the mental health of young people and suicide obviously being closely associated with depression. Uh, we have a, a rise in developmental disorders. So one in eight children now has a diagnosable mental health condition and a doubling in hospital admissions for self-harm in, in girls since 1997. So the mental health of our young people is declining. We have three times the number of young people attending A&E uh, for their mental health conditions just in the last decade. So something's going on. And, you know, there's lots of questions and discussions about what that might be. I, I hope to present some of them. Um, I guess I also want to say that obviously mental health and brain health are incredibly complex and there's no one size fits all, there's no magic bullet, but we need to be thinking about complex uh, interventions for complex disorders. We need to be thinking much more in an integrated way about the environment, both internal and external, and interventions that can be used in various areas uh, within the system or the system of dysfunction. But what about the other end of the scale? So the scale of the problem in older people. Now, certainly outside of corona times, um, dementia is the leading cause of death in the UK. And people are often surprised to hear that uh, because we hear much more, for example, about metabolic syndrome or the risks of type 2 diabetes, about heart disease and, and various cancers. But actually, dementia is our, our leading cause of death. And women have twice the risk 
of uh, dementia as men, particularly Alzheimer's disease, Alzheimer's being the most common form of dementia worldwide. Um, and more people are, are dying from Alzheimer's disease than breast cancer and prostate cancer combined. But it's not just the kind of in individual uh, experience or risks, actually the social care costs of dementia are larger than those that may be attributed to cancer, heart disease, and stroke combined. And this is when I always ask the question about why aren't we thinking more about brain health when actually it has a huge sociological um, burden. And therefore we should be thinking about it much more. Again, we should be thinking much more about prevention um, and we should be investing much more in early interventions, uh, recognition and treatment of these disorders as early as possible. Um, the we currently sit at around 51, 52 million global cases of Alzheimer's disease, and that's expected to treble uh, to about 150 by 2050. Um, and of course, there's no cure for Alzheimer's disease. And I, I tend to speak about Alzheimer's uh, almost as a, a broad term for neurodegenerative, neurodegenerative disorders because it encapsulates many of the physiological features and because it's our most common form. Um, and when we have a disease for which we have no cure, it means that prevention is really our, our best intervention, our best way of, of trying to combat the rising rates and, and getting in there early. So this is my argument for uh, why we should be paying much more attention to prevention for mental health and brain health as an extension of that. It's also worth knowing, though, that Dementia is not an inevitable part of aging. And, and I want to really emphasize that point because people often think, well, you know, it's age related. The older I get, I mean, the more likely I am to get it. That's true, but it's, it's not inevitable. It's not just, there's nothing I can do about it. I'll just cross my fingers and hopefully, hopefully I'll get lucky. Um, and that's not just me saying that. Actually, you can see that on the NHS website, um, that dementia is not an inevitable part of ageing. And we, there is a concern now, because yes, it is an age-related illness, that the older you get, the more likely you are, the higher risk you have of it. But actually, people are now being diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and neurodegenerative diseases of its kind much younger. So it's, it's less, it's starting to be less related to age and therefore more related to lifestyle. There's something about the way that we're living which is harming our brains. But there's a huge knowledge gap around dementia, diseases of, uh, of brain aging, such that only a quarter of adults thought that it was even possible to reduce their risk of developing the disease, whereas around 80% think that you can reduce your risk of diabetes and heart disease. Um, and, and that's a huge gap from what the science says, so the, the latest Lancet Commission, which says that at least one in three Global cases of Alzheimer's disease, so if we've got around 50 million, we're talking somewhere around 15, 16 million global cases, could be prevented, which is not a word often used, you know, it's not thrown away around lightly in science. Um, it could be prevented if we took the best case scenario. So essentially, if people were living to the, the best evidence that we have. Um, and so even though half of adults in the UK say that dementia is the disease that they fear the most, it's, a, it's it's the one that we're most frightened of, that we're worried we'll, we'll end up with some time in our, in our future. Only 1% could name the, well, what were then seven, but now nine known risk factors, um, plus an additional three, which were added in the most recent Lancet Commission uh, just published a couple of weeks ago. Um, and before you ask, they are type 2 diabetes, middle, you know, well, they're here. So things that are modifiable through shifts in, in lifestyle and the way that we're living. And then the most recent ones, uh, alcohol consumption, traumatic brain injury, particularly things uh, like sports, where people are taking blows to the head. Um, so boxing, MMA, football, roller derby, rugby, those sorts of things, um, and air pollution. So uh, growing evidence showing that people who live closer to areas of high air pollution have a greater risk 
of dementia. And I'll be talking about perhaps some of the underlying mechanisms for that in just a moment. So we have a huge knowledge gap between what the science says in terms of prevention of these illnesses for which we have no cure and what the public know about how much influence they have over uh, you know, the, these, life, these factors and, and shifting, um, shifting the needle in their favour, I guess. And we don't wait until our teeth fall out before we start brushing our teeth. You know, in physical health conditions, we are always thinking about prevention. Um, yet we don't for the brain. And I would quite like that to change. Uh, disorders of the brain and mental health are, you know, some of our biggest killers, um, huge risks for young people and older people alike, yet we don't talk about it. And uh, that's, of course, why I am here talking to you today. So what is the, how can we start thinking about prevention? So the main mechanism, the main principle that we think about for the brain is one called cognitive reserve. And uh, in my book, I call it the pension plan for your brain, because the idea is, is that you start investing early into your life so that you have a bigger pot to withdraw from later on. Um, and that's based on the uh, the evidence that we have now that your, your brain shrinks from, I mean, depending on your level of health and, and other factors, it starts to shrink by about one or 2% from your late 40s or 50s. Um, and that's considered normal brain aging. Um, but there are things that you can do to help retain or even increase your brain volume. And that's this principle of, of cognitive reserve. Um, and it was coined back in 1989, uh, a group of researchers uh, in a New York uh, residential home for, for older Jewish people were looking at those with a diagnosis of uh, cognitive decline and, and dementia um, and Alzheimer's disease. And typically, when we're thinking about Alzheimer's disease, there is a very close correlation between the severity of symptoms uh, while the person is alive and the degree of damage to the brain at post-mortem. Because a, a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease can only be given strictly post-mortem when you look for the characteristic uh, signs of damage in the brain. So often, usually there's a, a very close correlation between the severity of symptoms and the level of damage in the brain. But in this group of older adults, they found uh, quite an intriguing uh, anomaly, which was that there were some people for whom they were essentially symptom-free. They were very sharp, they were playing games, they were telling jokes, they were telling stories from their pasts. Um, and But when they died, there was this subgroup had quite serious damage that should have correlated to quite high uh, symptoms, quite severe symptoms, during their lives. Um, when comparing the brains and looking at them, what they saw though was that these brains of this special subgroup who had you know, no symptoms or, or, or few kind of low level symptoms while they were alive, but quite high damage, actually had heavier brains. Um, and it was suggested then and now demonstrated since that aspects of their lifestyles had meant, meant that they had built up additional brain volume during their lives so that like when uh, when there's a kind of diversion in the road so thinking about neuroplasticity the brain's ability to reshape and mold uh, and remold sorry um that so if you're driving down the road and there's a huge pothole in the middle of the street um if there are enough roads coming off then you can divert around it and you can still get to your destination through uh, through these diverted routes. And that's the basic principle of cognitive reserve. The more that you build in, the more resilience, the more volume that you build in early in your life, the more uh, res reserve that you will have, the, the extra volume you will have in order to draw on should your brain start that process of age-related decline. So I like to think about and to kind of simpli simplify these quite difficult, um, you know, the brain's a very complex organ, but to bring it down to two essential features, which I call the major players, uh, they are inflammation and neurogenesis. So inflammation being the uh, immune system's response to illness or injury. And it's very normal, natural and necessary in the acute phase. But there are features of our lifestyles, for example, that keep this elevated immune activation. And when that happens, essentially we're not adapted, the immune system, this stress response was not adapted for prolonged activation. 
and was adapted for short acute response to immediate threats to life. But when we're doing things in our lives, whether it's prolonged psychological stress, features of our lifestyle, our diets, our sedentary, uh, sedentary behaviours, then actually we can, it can lead to these uh, elevated um, chronic activation of the immune system. And when that happens, it can start to damage the body's own tissues and it can kick off inflammation in the brain, uh, which is known as neuroinflammation, which is associated with depression, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and neurodegenerative disorders such as Alzheimer's disease. So broadly, where it's possible, we want to reduce our levels of inflammation and, and neuroinflammation and increase uh, neurogenesis. So neuro being cell, brain cell, and genesis being the creation of, the creation of new brain cells, uh, the development of more connections uh, between those brain cells and the protection of the brain cells that you already have. So neurogenesis covers all of those uh, concepts. Um, and greater rates of neurogenesis are associated with a reduced risk of depression. And we see that there is less neurogenesis in the brains of people, um, of course, with neurodegenerative disorders, depression, and other um, psychological and psychiatric diagnoses. So we want to bring inflammation down and increase our rates of neurogenesis. And actually, and this is where I think this is really important information for the public, actually, there is an awful lot that we can do day to day to switch on neurogenesis and turn down inflammation. Um, and they're not complicated. Most of them are uh, low cost or free um, and can be implemented within a couple of minutes. So I, what I want to do uh, with the next 20 minutes, half hour or so, is just take you through some of the evidence for some of the ones um, that I think are most accessible. Uh, and the first one, perhaps uh, appropriate for me, um, and particularly just because I consider myself a hungry girl, uh, is uh, nutrition. Back in 2015, the Lancet Psychiatry sent out a statement uh, paper saying that nutrition is as important to psychiatry as it is to cardiology. And that was really a klaxon call to psychiatry, to psychology, to the mental health profession, professions and professionals, that we should be really, whenever we're assessing a patient, when we're thinking about a psychological disorder, we really should be taking nutrition into consideration when we're thinking about the underlying health of the brain um, as the organ of mental health and as an intervention for mental health conditions. Um, that was five years ago. Broadly, it often takes somewhere between 17 to 20 years for research to trickle down into frontline treatment. So potentially we're looking at another 10, 15 years before this starts to be um, regular recommendations or considerations that perhaps GPs might be taking into account um, on a regular consistent basis when they're meeting patients complaining of things like depression. But uh, in the meantime, um, I would like to get that information out to you directly. So what is your brain on food? And really, we can look at a range of uh, sources of evidence from nutritional science. So in terms of epidemiology, for example, the SUN trial was a trial of 10, over 10,000 people in Spain. And it was a, um, a cohort study. So we, a group of people and followed them up over, over several years. And looking at people's diets, they broke them down into quintiles, they broke them down into fives. And what they found was that the people who ate the, the, the top two quintiles, so the people who had the best kind of 40% quality diet adherence to the Mediterranean style diet, had a 30% reduced risk of the people in quintile five, so those who had the kind of worst diets, so the, the least nutritious diets, the diets highest in refined sugars and saturated fats, high in salts and that sort of thing. Um, in terms of intervention st studies, the, the first RCT, the first um, randomized control trial, which has since been replicated, was the SMILES trial back in 2017 um, out of uh, Australia and um, Felice Jacker led that study, which took a group of people who already had a diagnosis of depression, clinical depression, um, and already had a poor diet. So these people were already in treatment, either in psychotherapy, um, um, with medication or both, so and for a while, um, and also had ba bad diets. 
And what they did was to split them into two groups. One group got befriending, which is already an established uh, treatment that helps to improve depressive symptoms. So that was the control group. And on the other side, people got the same hours of exposure to a nutritional intervention. So um, some fruits and vegetables um, and some meetings with a dietitian to help improve their the quality of their diets. At the end of this admittedly small trial, 30, uh, a third of the uh, participants had gone into remission. So that's about 12 people or so um, had gone into remission. Um, and we've since seen replications of improvements in depression through just nutritional interventions in things like the Healthy Med and the PREDIMED trials um, and other meta-analyses have corroborated that as well. So again, not a magic bullet. It, it, won't work for everybody and obviously depression is much more complex than just a nutritional intervention but it, what it suggests is that for some people the quality of the diet is an additive factor in their mental health condition and really that makes sense when we get on to the next slide um Similarly, we have shown that a healthy diet, not me, myself, but uh, uh, Dr. Martha Morris out in America has showed that the uh, MIND diet can reduce your risk of Alzheimer's disease. And the DII is a dietary inflammatory index, which is a scale that measures the inflammatory potential of one's diet. And that showed, for example, that the more in the higher the inflammatory potential of the diet, the more likely people were to have uh, signs of inflammation in the body, a higher white blood cell count, um, and were at greater risk of recurrent depression and things like that. So a reminder that your brain is made of food. And so this, um, full disclosure, this, these are uh, mouse hippocampal neurons. And these are, so on the uh, left of your screen is a hippocampal neuron from a mouse pup whose mother was fed sufficient DHA, the essential fatty acid found in oily fish, which forms about 30% of the outer cell membrane um, of, your, of your brain cells. And on the right of your screen, so the, the one, the, the image that has a, you know, more black in it, um, is the hippocampal neuron of a mouse pup whose mother was fed insufficient DHA. And essentially what you see is a 50% reduction in the uh, number of dendrites or essentially all the connections that build the brain. So this becomes one of the real areas of concern when we're thinking about developmental disorders in children um, and potentially the rise uh, or potential risks of the rise of veganism if people aren't properly supplementing diets that cut out brain essential nutrients like essential fatty acids and, and B12 and so forth. So that was very briefly uh, nutrition. There's more to say on that, but um, I could literally be here all, after, all evening. Uh, physical activity. Physical activity is probably um, the, the most robust evidence base we have for a lifestyle intervention being able to increase the volume of your brain. And that's overall volume, but also in particular hippocampal volume. And I focus on hippocampal volume because the hippocampus is the area of the brain which is the seat of memory. And it's the area of the brain that is, is most and most severely damaged. So first and most severely damaged in Alzheimer's disease. Um, but it's the area of the brain. So it used to be thought, for example, that um, essentially you were born with all the brain cells you were ever going to have give or take, and therefore you had to just look after them. Otherwise, you know, it was a downhill slope from there. Uh, but since then, and certainly within the last 10, 15 years, it's been established that adult neurogenesis is a thing. And so the adult human brain's capacity to form new brain cells from stem cells. And in particular, in it only happens in a couple of areas of the brain, but in particular in the hippocampus. So that's where most of this uh, research evidence is, is focused. So very briefly, all types of exercise are important to overall uh, brain health. So greater cardiovascular fitness is associated with a larger hippocampus and better memory performance. Uh, ha you have less age-related brain shrinkage, better performance, better retention, better processing speed. and reduces and again prevents and that's been established now prevents depression so 
and again, I want to be careful because obviously I'm a psychologist and I, I understand we can't just kind of tell people to go go for a walk and you'll feel better. That's not what we're saying. But what we're saying is that overall, if you take a large group of people, have them exercise on a regular basis, some people will be protected uh, or have less severe de depression through that intervention. Um, and so we're thinking really about a population level intervention rather than an individual intervention for, for, for one person. Resistance exercise is equally as important. So we know, for example, that resistance training and, and the mechanism behind this is that when you, the same hormones that help build muscle also cross the bloodstream and help to build brain cells. So we're thinking about BDNF and IGF-1. So brain derived neurotropic factor, which is a growth factor for the brain, um, but is also um, circ circulates through the body um, and insulin like growth factor one. Um, so women, older women who weight trained three times a week had fewer areas of damage, fewer lesions in their brain than older women in the same study who did not. Um, and we see a relationship between improved muscle, muscle strength and cognitive performance in older people. And I, I guess I also want to put in a good word for walking, because often when we think about exercise interventions, people often think you have to have a complete overhaul of your lifestyle, need to start running marathons, uh, need to kind of become some sort of fitness influencer, gym bro, and that's not the case at all. And there's lots of really beautiful work demonstrating, for example, that walking can be hugely beneficial for the brain. Um, and again, it, it tends to be much more accessible for people. So a prospective study of, of self reports showed that um, walking was associated with um, grey matter volume uh, several years later. Um, but in particular, I, I'd like to draw your attention to the, the last section. So um, Exercise training increased hippocampal volume. So they took a group of people and started them. So it was a pr prospective cohort study, started them on an exercise uh, regime. And these were older people. Um, exercise training increased hippocampal volume by 2%. And you remember I said that your brain starts to shrink by one or 2% in your older years. So that was effectively reversing age-related brain loss. And in this trial, uh, participants started by walking just 10 minutes um, and increase their walking duration by just five minutes per week. So again, nothing hugely arduous. We're not asking people to walk for hours and hours and hours a day. It was 40 minutes of walking three times a week at a, a, a kind of fairly gentle pace. It wasn't even very brisk. So essentially the message is that whenever you're moving, you're giving your brain a boost. And to, to touch on some of the mechanisms there, I mentioned the upregulation of BDNF, that, that is the, the most studied, the most understood of the, the brain growth factors. Increased production of IGF-1, attenuation of inflammation. So while exercise is acutely inflammatory, your body kind of responds to it by turning up your immune response. Over the long term, it actually lowers your baseline levels of inflammation. Um, increased uh, blood flow to the brain. Um, which is one of the important factors for something like a vascular dimension, so dementia. And, uh, you know, because your brain has such this high energy demand, it needs to be constantly supplied with glucose, with nutrients, with oxygen, which means it needs a healthy blood supply and health, healthy vascularity. Um, and so exercise helps to maintain the health of the circulatory system that feeds the brain. Um, we know that, for example, that... Um, exercise can help absorb uh, neurotoxins from what's called the kyneuronine pathway, um, improve sleep, which by itself, you know, these are knock-on effects which help improve uh, mental health. We know, hopefully we all know by now, how important uh, sleep is for your well-being in your psychological functioning. And also through induction of heat shock proteins. Heat shock proteins are Pretty much, you know, as it says on the tin, they are a group of proteins that are upregulated and released when the body is exposed to heat. Um, and so exercise, which warms the core body temperature, but also things like sauna exposure and hot baths, increase the production of these heat shock proteins. And what they do is a range of things in the brain, um, and particularly in terms of Alzheimer's disease, heat shock proteins can act as chaperones 
for amyloid beta. So amyloid beta is a, a protein that builds up in Alzheimer's disease. It's associated, it builds up in the spaces between the neurons. And when it does that, it can block the communication between those brain cells. And when brain cells aren't getting the feedback of communication, they start to atrophy and die. So we really want lots of clearance of AB, or at least not too much buildup of it. You're, you know, it builds up normally, but usually your brain can, can clear it out through its own processes. What heat shock proteins can do is to act as a chaperone to stop amyloid beta, this protein, from misfolding and from clumping up. It can also help to uh, break it down and send it away for recycling. So heat shock proteins and heat exposure are starting to be really investigated for um, potentially preventative measures for Alzheimer's disease. All, all right, and something else, another accessible uh, intervention for brain health is the breath. And in particular, um, the stimulation of the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve, I'm gonna go slightly doughy-eyed here. It's, it's my favorite nerve. <laughs> um, I think it's beautiful. Um, this is a, an image from the Wellcome Trust um, which is, is free. You can download it if you love the vagus nerve as much as I do. Um, so the vagus nerve is this long wandering nerve. That's where it gets its name um, from uh, you know, vague, vagrant, uh, vagabond uh, wandering that goes from the base of the spine all the way down. So it loops in under the throat. It connects in through the heart, across into the lungs into the liver, down through um, the spleen, and, and finally into the gut. So it's the main structural feature of the gut-brain axis. If you've heard that term, the gut-brain axis, really the, the structural component of it is this vagus nerve. And interestingly, if you think about the vagus nerve as a motorway with 10 lanes, about eight of those lanes are going upwards from the body, so from the gut and, and the other central organs into the brain. Um, but it's also the major component of the parasympathetic nervous system. So the parasympathetic nervous system is the counterpart or the opposite part of the sympathetic nervous system. And the sympathetic nervous system you are likely to know as your fight or flight reflex or response. So your sympathetic nervous system is the one that you know, switches on and it starts re releasing glucocorticoids um, and adrenaline. It, you know, shuts down your digestion, uh, shuts down your libido, your sex hormones, your growth hormone, um, in order to divert energy and resources to the limbs in order for you to be able to run or fight. Um, and so all of those things that you don't want to be doing whilst you're running and fighting, you know, having sex, um, digesting food, you know, having a snack, um, get shut down while you're in an SNS, a sympathetic nervous state. But they get switched back on in a parasympathetic nervous state. So we think of um, the sympathetic nervous system as your fight or flight and the parasympathetic nervous system as your rest and digest. Um, it also gets uh, called the feed and breed uh, nervous system. So they cannot act at the same time. You know, one is switched on and, and one is switched off. And the vagus nerve is the major component of this rest and digest system. And it's also potently anti-inflammatory and it's being investigated at the moment um, in terms of reducing inflammation in, in arthritis so um, and, and usually the way that it works vagus nerve stimulation uh, works by the insertion of a kind of battery pack it's kind of like a pacemaker that goes in just underneath the just on your collarbone and a little electrode wraps around the vagus nerve and gives it an, an electrical stimulus However, it is also accessible where it loops in down just behind uh, the throat through the breath. And this is why, if you've ever been stressed and someone says, take some deep breaths, this is what we're talking about. The problem is people don't often tell you which kinds of breath you should be taking. Um, really, they should be breaths that focus on a long exhalation that require a bit of constriction in the back of the throat, because that's when you stimulate the vagus nerve. Um, but it's through the constriction of the back of the throat and the activation of the diaphragm because the vagus nerve innovates, it goes through the diaphragm, that you get this stimulation of the vagus nerve 
and this turning on of this rest, digest, relaxation, anti-anxiety response. So we know that vagus nerve stimulation is uh, provides, you know, is associated with increased expression of this BDNF, this kind of all round brain growing uh, growth factor. Um, it's associated with increased hippocampal neurogenesis, which is exactly what we want. You know, we want, uh, if, again, if we're thinking about cognitive reserve and protecting the brain going forwards, we want a, as big a hippocampus as we could healthily uh, maintain and manage so that in our later years, we've got that much more volume to hold on to um, and to retain that memory as much as we can. In clinical trials, it's shown a 30% improvement or reversal in chronic uh, in chronic treatment resistant depression, um, and so it's a kind of almost off-label treatment now uh, for people who are chronically depressed, um, and is associated with increased secretion of acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter which is required for um, a process called long-term potentiation, but essentially uh, the learning and, and memory process. So, I, I don't know if I, I could talk about this stuff all day, um, but I just, that, that's the thing. I really want you to understand that we need to be thinking about the brain much, much more. We need to be thinking much more about prevention. Um, and we need to be letting people know that, again, whilst there are no magic bullets, there are, there's no panacea that's going to fix everything for everyone that actually in the same way that we can intervene and help prevent heart disease or lung cancer that there are things that we can do to help reduce our risk you know improve our chances of having a healthy brain in later life um, these are just a, a tiny little pinch of the other other things that we can be thinking about. So like, as I said, in nutrition, there's actually a huge uh, range of foods that are associated um, in clinical trials with Im improved brain health. And um, here are some of the other features. So things that I quite like people to think about, obviously sleep, fasting um, is a really interesting intervention in terms of its association with um, neuroprotection. So in particular, the hormone ghrelin, which is the hunger hormone, um, seems to be neuroprotective, which might be one of the reasons that uh, people who fast seem to have better brain health outcomes. Physical activity, a vagus nerve stimulation, as I've mentioned, heat exposure. Um, I talk about dental health because the, the existing theory of Alzheimer's disease isn't proving very convincing. So the amyloid cascade hypothesis, which is where um, amyloid beta, that protein that I spoke about, was the the big problem. It, it was, it used to be believed that just amyloid it built up, and that was a problem. It caused Alzheimer's disease. However, many of the large um, clinical or pharmaceutical companies, Eli Lilly and Johnson and Johnson, um, have scrapped their trials of drugs that help to remove out, uh, amyloid beta because they don't improve Alzheimer's disease. Um, and so they're, for my money, the more convincing uh, theory, or one of the more convincing underlying um, arguments is um, the chronic infection hypothesis, which maybe we'll talk about later, but certainly in my book, I talk about um, some of the evidence for gum disease as one of the chronic illnesses that is associated with increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. Um, other things that are associated with better brain health and reduced risk of Alzheimer's disease in later life is purpose, um, better relationships. So I talk about all of that stuff. So I just want to leave you with uh, possibly one of my favorite quotes um, from European Neuropsychopharmacology in 2017. One thing is for sure, depression and mental health problems in general can no longer be seen only as disorders of the mind or indeed only as disorders of the brain. The strong impact of the immune system on emotions and behavior demonstrates that mental health is the health of the whole body. So that is me. Um, you know, I don't, I want us to start thinking about prevention in mental health as we do in physical health. 
Um, what happens in mental health is that we wait until a crisis occurs before we pull people back and say, now let's see if we can get you back to baseline. Um, and we need a public health campaign for the brain so that more people know that we do have, and again, I, I want to be cautious, some power over um, our mental health and, and, and some ability to protect brain health for the long term. So thank you. Oh, thank, oh, you. thank you very much, very much for that. That's really, really helpful um, and really interesting. I, I was, as you were talking, I was thinking, oh, I must go and watch this again. And I've just realised I'm, I'm actually halfway through the book, so I will actually just carry on reading the book. Um, I do have it on my Kindle. I'll have to admit, I've, I've become a Kindle fan. It's so much easier to read than books. But uh, yeah. Thank you so much. There's been loads of uh, interest in the chat and um, quite a lot of really good questions coming up in the Slido. So everyone, please continue to look at the Slido. Please upvote the questions that you like uh, and then we can come back to them in the uh, in the Q&A uh, shortly. Just a couple of things. Um, I didn't introduce myself, but I'm guessing that my name was under a picture. I'm Cleo. I'm from Winchester Skeptics. But the uh, important person tonight behind the scenes running everything is Matty from Oxford. So uh, uh, big Matty, uh, big, big Matty. Big thank you to Matty, please, from everybody who's he's doing a really good job there. Um, next week, we have James Ball talking about uh, who really runs the Internet. So please join us for that. Um, I'm, I won't say anything about the links because I know the mods have been really good about posting them regularly. So we're going to have a break for about 15 minutes. It's now, so that means we'll be coming back at eight o'clock um, and uh, look forward to seeing you all again soon. Hi everybody, uh, welcome back. Um, it's lovely to see you all again and thank you so much for all your active work in the Slido where there are some really interesting questions which we will get through as many of them as we can. Um, I'm just going to make one quick announcement before we do and that is at some point in the chat as we go on there'll be a link to Lockins Razor. That is our virtual pub uh, on Zoom where we meet after the, um, after the Q&A is over and it goes on as long as you want it to go on for. So if you're interested in joining us, just click on the link and it'll take you to it. So on with the questions. Um, as I said, they're really interesting. And there was one particular one that uh, Kimberly thought was really important and uh, which we thought we should address first. And that is, uh, so um, uh, I am basically, I think, am I basically, no, I am, Excuse me. I'll get it right. I can read, honestly. Um, I am basically too late to build a financial pension pot before I retire. Is there a point at which it's too late to build a pension pot for my brain? All right. So, yes, I, I, I always want to answer this question. It's, it's essentially the is it too late for me question. And essentially what the research tells us is that up until the point that you are diagnosed with moderate to severe dementia, so moderate to severe Alzheimer's disease, it's not too late. So there is something you can do. And if you never, obviously, if you never get that diagnosis, then it's it's never too late. Um, and that was really demonstrated really beautifully in what's called the finger study, uh, which is <laughs> the uh, Finnish let me, uh, I'll read it up. It's the Finnish Geriatric Intervention Study to Prevent Cognitive Impairment and Disability. Uh, and they took a group of older people, 50s, 60s, 70s, who were already at high risk for dementia. And they improved their nutrition, their physical activity, and their uh, cognitive engagement, their mental stimulation. And that two years, they found that in engaging in these activities preserved or even improved cognitive performance. So even if you're already older, even if you're already at high risk of dementia, Alzheimer's disease, if you can start building in these interventions, you can start protecting your brain health and reducing your risk. Great. That's actually really, really good news for everyone. So yeah, thank you. Um, the next question, there's quite a few on a similar theme, but I think they're all slightly different. So uh, we'll, we will go through them. Um, would earlier screening for mild cognitive impairment and early signs of dementia reduce the burden of disease on the uh, at a population level? Thank you. Um, 
Yes. So uh, the, the, the understanding is, yes, it would. Because, for example, in, in the finger trial, um, if you found a group of people, so if you did, if we did a kind of, if we were able to sweep the nation and give everybody cognitive tests and find those who were already at risk of MCI, then you'd be able to offer them these kinds of groups of interventions, or if, at least give them the advice about these interventions that have been demonstrated to reduce risk and improve outcomes. So if we were able to have better screening, better investment in screening for, um, essentially it's midlife factors. So from midlife is the point at which we want to be thinking, you know, it's, it, it's, I want people to be thinking about it as early as possible, but certainly by midlife, we want to be thinking about these things. Um, because even though Alzheimer's disease uh, again, to use it as a kind of catch-all, is uh, diagnosed usually in your 50s and 60s. Really, the damage takes decades to build up. And if we were look, looking to the brains of people in their 40s, um, then the damage would already be starting to accumulate there. So, yes, early screening, early uh, intervention would potentially reduce costs. And as, we, as, I, as I said in one of the top slides, that the social care costs of uh, Alzheimer's you know, kind of overshadows cancer and, and heart disease and stroke. So yes, I think there could be a huge financial uh, cost saving for, for the health service. Given that we don't have um, this kind of screening, would you then be recommending that every one of us who's over the age of 40 should behave as if we were testing positive? Yes, I think so. So, And I think particularly because we don't have a cure. You know, there, there isn't, there's no pill that you can get or, or be given that will do anything other than help you manage your symptoms. Um, there's no drug that's going to make it better. So we, we, if we have something like hypertension or heart disease, actually we do have effective drugs that can help to bring your blood pressure down, or we can give people um, insulin or modafinil to manage their, their blood glucose. But there isn't anything for Alzheimer's disease, which, again, is the leading cause of death in the UK, certainly outside of Corona. Um, and it, again, these things don't have to be onerous. You know, it's about having a bowl of leafy greens with your your prep sandwich at lunchtime or going for a, a 20 minute walk. You know, they don't have to be onerous. So um, I would say that there is no harm and probably significant benefit to assuming you're at medium risk <laughs> and, and trying to get some of these uh, activities under your belt. Great, thanks. The um, the next question, you mentioned modafinil, but the mm -hmm. next question is about nootropics. Mm -hmm. um, there was someone asked a question about that last week, so I don't know whether there's one person who's particularly interested or whether it is a general uh, interest of, of our mm -hmm. watchers. Uh, the question is, are nootropics legitimate brain capacity enhancers or are they not supported by the evidence? Um, it kind of depends on which ones you know obviously the the most common most accessible most used neuro neurotropic in the world is caffeine um which does improve your attention um uh, and and so uh we know that it does do that we know for example that nicotine again is is another very common one which uh, increases focus and certainly seems to help reduce distractibility um, if you're focusing. Uh, obviously, we don't want people to take up smoking in order to help revision, but um, it does seem to be effective in terms of uh, cognitive capacity, in terms of attention um, and staying on task. Um, some of the others are still a bit niche, uh, so it's not really clear. And, and it Again, that cognitive capacity is usually an ac acute feature. So if we're thinking about uh, nicotine, uh, it's, it imp improves attention in the acute phase, maybe for an hour, half an hour, and then it fades. So it's not as if it's a consistent feature. Um, but also there is a, um, it hits a threshold effect such, such that you'll need a bigger dose as you go on if you take it on a consistent basis which again, you probably don't want to be doing. Um, you certainly don't want to be smoking in uh, for your brain health, that's anti-brain health. Um, so most of the uh, nootropics seem to be effective at improving things like attention in the acute phase, um, but you need to be taking them consistently. And that, but that is separate from the actual structure and structure of your, your brain um, and its health. So, you know, it's not as if they would be effective for protecting you against Alzheimer's disease or something like that. Right. So in the immediate here and now, but that's all pretty much. Yeah. 
Um, another question about uh, getting older, pretty much, um, from Paul, or picture. Mm. He says, my father has Alzheimer's, so I'm probably genetically dis predisposed to it. What can I do at the age of 67 to minimise the risk? Okay, so uh, I, guess, I guess I've partly answered the, first, the second part of the question, but it's worth saying actually that um, less than 5% of Alzheimer's cases are genetically linked. So most of Alzheimer's, so there are people who have um, variations of the A. POE4 allele, which increases your risk. It seems to have something to do with your transport of fats across your um, your brain cell membrane. Um, and so people who have those alleles do have an increased risk, but they are less than 5% of all the cases of Alzheimer's disease. Most of the cases of Alzheimer's disease are what are called sporadic, which is either kind of bad luck or this association with lifestyle. And, and if I take you back to that Lancet study, which said one in three, so 30% of Alzheimer's cases could be prevented with changes to, to lifestyle um, and daily activity. So I guess I would counter what Paul says and says, You're, because his father has it, he's probably prone to it. Probably not, actually. Um, it's probable that your father had, uh, it's much more likely that he had a sporadic, especially if he's already 67, because if you did have these alleles, they tend to lead to earlier onset Alzheimer's disease. So if you're 67 and you don't have Alzheimer's disease and you have a father who did have Alzheimer's disease, then actually it's probably, it was probably not genetic. And as I said in, in the, the previous answer to the previous question, until at such a point as you are diagnosed with moderate disease, these lifestyle interventions seem to be effective at least re at reducing your risk. That's really good news, actually. So that's really, I think quite a lot of people will be taking note of that one. I'm just going to take a question out. It's a little bit further down, but I think it fits very well with these preventative ones we've been asking. And that's uh, uh, someone who's uh, not put their name up anonymous says, "What's the biggest thing anyone? It was the biggest thing anyone could do to lower the risk of Alzheimer's if they're in their twenties, forties, sixties, eighties." Okay, do you want one for every season. Um, I'm assuming it's similar. -ish. <laughs> well, I think. The biggest bang for your buck, uh, you know, if you could only do one thing, would... See, I'm a big fan of nutrition, but the probably ex exercise uh, certainly has the most robust uh, evidence base at the moment. And because it hits so many of those different um, systems, so nutrition might improve it can improve perfusion for example obviously it provides your brain with the building blocks it needs for a healthy structure but as in the slide on exercise exercise upregulates bdnf it upregulates igf1 it improves uh perfusion it, it improves the health of your uh of the blood cells in your brain it reduces inflammation so it covers so many of the different systems that exercise um, and I, I won't choose one, but any exercise that you like, that you enjoy, that you can do consistently is probably the, the biggest bang for your buck in terms of, of long term brain health. That's and more really good news. Um, uh, well, it is for those of us who like exercise anyway. Um, the next question, um, how do you do the vagus nerve stimulating breathing? Yeah, yes, because I mentioned it and then I think we sped on. Um, so uh, in the book, I offer what's called a four, four, eight breath. So that's an inhalation and, and they should be through your nose. I do, I've written a whole section on why nasal breathing is, is so important for, for the brain. Um, so it should be a inhalation to the count of four through your nose, hold the breath for a count of four, and then a long, slow exhalation again through your nose for a count of eight. And they are quite slow counts. So it would be as the inhalation. So it's like a one, two, three, four, and then that's the whole, so at least a second each. And then in order to have a long, slow exhalation, you have to constrict the back of your throat. If anybody out there has done yoga, um, you can, or you can look up on, on YouTube, the Ujjayi breath, um, which shows you how to do this constriction because you need to kind of make an almost audible sound in that breath in order to to achieve it. Um, but in order to get a long, slow exhalation, you have to slightly constrict the back of your throat and it's that constriction with the airflow 
that stimulates the vagus nerve. So I would recommend, um, if, rather than have me demonstrate it for you, you can uh, look online for um, Ujjayi breath, or it's also called, I think, victorious breath, I think. Victorious or ocean, or ocean breath uh, in yoga, yeah. I am guessing, so I'm not looking at the chat at the moment, I'm guessing our mods are frantically looking this up and posting this in the chat for anyone who's <laughs> <laughs> Follows up with a really silly question. Is that why weightlifting is so good? Because when you uh, do weightlifting, one of the things you do is you really pressurize um, pressurize your core and if very vagal stimulating. Mm. Is that linked or is it just coincidental? So, I mean, weightlifting would cover lots of different bases. So, so if you are, you know, if you're a heavy, heavy lifter and you're, you are constricting and you've got that um, the innovation and the constriction across the diaphragm, you'll you'll be getting an aspect of that but also weightlifting is upregulating that bdnf and igf1 those growth factors that help to build muscle and then cross into the to the brain and help to um support brain uh brain cell health as well so yeah there's there's something for everyone <laughs> um uh a question here about vegans, uh, and I know there's a number of people interested in, in healthy eating while vegan. Any major advice for vegans aside from B12? Um, aside from B12, it would be uh, omega-3s. Um, and particularly, so, um, because there are three types, three main types of omega-3 fatty acids, these long chain uh, fatty acids. Um, there's ALA, which is found in walnuts and flax seeds and other seeds. Um, there's EPA and DHA, which are found essentially in oily, oily fish, marine foods. Um, now, strictly ALA is the only one that is essential in the classical sense that you cannot uh, produce it in the body. It has to come from the diet because strictly the body can produce these two. So first EPA and then DHA. But our level of conversion is incredibly low. It's about 8%. Um, and we th and women do ever so slightly better, but not much. And we think that the level of conversion is so low because at some point in our evolutionary history, we had access to coastal food sources. And so we didn't need to keep making it ourselves, even though the brain is made up of these fats. We didn't need to keep making them ourselves because we had access to them preformed in a reliable food source. Um, so your brain is made up of um, particularly DHA for the brain cells and EPA for anti-inflammatory action. Um, and really there isn't a reliable source of those from um, plants. So I would be saying for vegans or people who don't eat very much fish, don't like the taste of fish, um, are, you know, are mindful about fish stocks, um, an algae based uh, DHA supplement, uh, DHA and EPA that contains um 50 milligrams each epa and dha uh, would be the recommendation along with a b complex a b12 a b complex and you may some of the evidence is still kind of being worked through at the moment you may want to think about choline as well so again uh, choline literally goes in to make a that, that neurotransmitter i mentioned earlier on acetylcholine which is essential for learning and memory long-term potentiation it's found abundantly in foods um, in, in animal related foods so particularly like egg yolks are rich in choline so that but there hasn't been as much uh, research into it so a prudent vegan might want to think about um, a choline supplement as well and I am, I'm not sure whether this is, this is accurate or not, but I think I might have read that taking supplements isn't as good as eating the actual stuff. So is that correct? And if it is correct, I mean, you mentioned algal, does that work better than a straightforward, here's, here's it just in a pill? Yeah, so uh, certainly with omega-3 fats, so the, there's, there are other proteins in um, fish that seem to be anti-Alzheimer's. So uh, and and obviously nutrients work in synergy. They're not, you know, we don't eat nutrients, we eat foods. And so the nutrients within them work in synergy um, and, and in balance. So it is always better to try to get the whole food if you can, um, if that's available to you. And, and I say an algae based source because often vegan supplements will say, um, you know, a rich source of omega-3, but it will be ALA, which the body can't convert very well into the forms that the brain needs. So you just want to be mindful. Um, and with the algae sauce, the algae is where the fish get it in the first place. So you're kind of 
cutting out the middle fish um, and uh, going straight to the original source. So if you, uh, whole food, if you can, uh, if you can't or don't wish to, then the algae-based source is the reliable source of DHA, which is so crucial for development and the structure of the brain, um, which you won't be getting enough of if you're only getting the ALA form from flax seeds and, and walnuts and, and those sorts of things. Thank yeah. you. I'm sure a lot of people will have been taking notes there. Um, Sean Ellis has asked a question uh, about COVID, which is, do we have any idea what effect COVID-19 might have on our long-term brain health? Or is mm. it um, I mean, we don't know very much about long-term anything with COVID yet, but some evidence is certainly demonstrating that there are lots of neurological side effects of COVID, and that might be because it seems to attack blood vessels. So this is why people are getting um, problems with their hearts. Um, and there were, remember that people were getting COVID toes, it was called, little blisters around their toes. Um, certainly younger people, that was one of the main symptoms for COVID for them, because it seemed to be attacking the, the blood vessels. Um, and this is obviously a big concern because you have so many hundreds of miles of blood vessels in your brain and that people secondary to the main uh, symptoms of, of COVID are getting things like um, strokes and neurological symptoms. Some people are arriving in A&E with psychosis, mood disorders um, and things like that. So there are certainly, if you're on, on, on Twitter, there is a new journal um, which is collecting case studies of neurological COVID associated neurological um, complaints and disease. Um, and I, I think we would just, it's kind of, we're going to have to wait and see. Um, but yeah, there certainly does seem to be a relationship between increase of things that seem to be related to kind of brain vascularity and neuroinflammation. So I said that neuroinflammation is associated with schizophrenia and depression and, and Alzheimer's and so, and so forth. And there does seem to be a, a correlation emerging. That's quite worrying. So you, you, I mean, we hear a lot about clotting problems, don't we, with, with COVID? Yes. So obviously, that's the, the vascular, but the, the inflammation, brain inflammation sounds scary. I think we all need to, just a reminder to everyone to carry on being safe and careful. We don't want all yeah. our audience to, to get ill. Um, Skeptical Gumby from Oxford asks, would a public health scheme run by the NHS specifically advocating measures to build brain size be a cost-effective cost way of reducing the impact of dementia? Okay, so uh, that would be hard to tell because it depends on what the, it's always about the uptake of these interventions. Um, so if uh, Public Health England and NHS got together and said, Look, we're going to we're going to take this seriously and probably in a post COVID world. Um, we're going to you know talk about this and help people understand this. You would. The major hurdle, the big barrier with the brain is that it's just not very sexy. Um, and when we're dealing with the brain, it's very much about playing the long game. Um, and, you know, I, I, I spend a lot of time on social media kind of talking about the brain and really you're up against it with the brain, because unlike the body where you can say, do this 12 week plan and you'll have, you know, rock hard abs in you know, in three months time and you'll look hot and you'll be able to see your transformation and you can show your before and after and everyone will give you praise and adulation. Um, you cannot do that with the brain. Um uh, and you know no one's going to see it no one's going to give you a like for your brain selfie it's it's just not going to happen um so you really have to get people interested in the long game um and that's i think a major hurdle it's one of the things i talk about um in the back of the book the editor made me put it in the back instead of the front because she said it was it was quite depressing at the beginning but i've given a list of cognitive biases reasons that people won't put the information into action and one of them is delay discounting the idea that we value something far off much less than we do something that's immediate or accessible so if i offer you cleo 20 pounds uh next thursday or five pounds now, 
you're much more likely to go for the fiver just because it's right here, because it's accessible, because you want it, and because you know you could be you know often spending it. Um, and who and knows whether you'd be there with the twenty pounds in, in a week's time? Exactly. <laughs> Do you trust this space? Um, <laughs> And, and so the idea that you might have to put effort in now to protect your brain health in 20 years time, 30 years time is a huge psychological hurdle to get over. So in theory, yes, it would be cost effective because of that huge social um, cost burden, you know, and not just a social cost burden, but, you know, these are devastating diseases that that people they forget their families they forget their own lives they you know it's confusion and personality change and and emotional ability and 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 anger you know it it robs people of their entire histories so it's a devastating group of diseases so i think it would be cost effective but it's kind of humanitarian um but you really would need to be on the game in terms of behavior change mechanisms and getting people on board for this long-term investment I particularly like the way you uh, didn't espouse one particular form of exercise over any other. And I, I remember what you actually said was, whatever you enjoy. Presumably that's because what, what you're going to do. That's what you're going to do, exactly. And we we get very stuck on... What's really interesting about exercise and physical activity and movement in general is that the human body is capable of more movement patterns than any animal on the planet, right? We are capable of dance we're capable of climbing we can pirouette no no one else can pirouette maybe some small creature under the water can but do you know what i mean like you know we're capable of all these exquisite movement patterns but somehow when we think about exercise or movement we decide that it has to be kind of this one this one and running you know that we, we limit ourselves to these tiny this tiny range of overall movements and so it's it's really helpful if people can remember that whatever way you move you know if you're a dancer then then dance if you prefer to walk you know buy some roller skates and and learn to skate if that's the way you enjoy moving through space then then do it because it's the thing that you will stick with and so it doesn't have to be these pre prescribed sets of movements that you have to do in a gym um all movement is wonderful and it's you know aside from being good for your brain it's just this beautiful expression of the capacity of the human body right thank you um, a, a more lighthearted question now. Uh, I get Linda asks, and actually I, I second this question. I get confused about the heat thing. Is a hot <laughs> bath good or bad for me? Um, it's good for you. Oh, good. So the heat thing, um, yes, I guess the word shock perhaps gives the sense that it's it's not good for you, but that's just the name that they were given. So the heat shock proteins generally are uh, good and they work in several ways to help essentially they've done some lovely study studies um, in Finland which showed a dose response effect of men who use a sauna essentially the more often they use a sauna the lower their risk of Alzheimer's disease and it seemed to be related to this upregulation in these heat shock proteins that act as chaperones to help stop outside uh, amyloid beta from misfolding and clumping and blocking um, the neuron and also helping with its clearance. So um, saunas, hot baths, good. Excellent. That's really good news for us. Um, back to diet. Is uh, Anonymous asks, mm -hmm. is there any connection between the mental health issues that you were talking about and the current Western diet that we have? Um, that's the growing and prevailing theory. Um, I've done separately to this a series of um, podcasts called Crime and Nourishment, which uh, look back at a group of uh, randomized control trials that were first done 20 years ago and have since had international replication, showing a relationship between diet and violence. Um, it's, it's just... A, I started out with a question and I just went to somewhere else and it was just it's really extraordinary. Um, but all of the researchers that I spoke to um, were very clear. And even Professor Michael Crawford back in the 70s was saying, particularly around um, the low intake of omega-3 fatty acids, because they form so so, so much of, the, of a healthy brain um, and that 
the NHS recommendations right now, for example, are for us to eat two portions of fish a week, of which one should be oily, and most people aren't achieving that. Um, and he was saying back in the 70s, look, if we're looking at our population intakes of these foods, which we know to be crucial for the health of our brains, we are stacking up for ourselves a, a mental health crisis. So the low intake of omega-3 in the Western diet, but also the, the amount of free sugar in the Western diet, so added sugars. Um, and there are some studies that have demonstrated that even in, in fit, young, healthy men, so essentially the classic university student that is always used as a guinea pig in uh, clinical research, um, just three average size, and these were American sizes, so I can't remember exactly what the, the milliliters were, but um, three average sized um, sodas a week increased markers of inflammation by about 300% in healthy young men. Um, and that seems to just be because it's this huge bolus of sugar that the body just isn't adapted to absorb. Um, and it's, you know, and it's what we saw in the SMILES trial where th that nutritional improvement seemed to, at least for a subgroup of, of the depressed patients, improve their symptoms. So, you know, I, I, the chapter in the book on nutrition is the biggest chapter in the book. The, the editor wanted to take it down and I was like, <laughs> this needs to stay in um, because, yes, this rise in um psychological disorders, psychiatric diseases, uh, particularly in young people, seems to be something to do either with deficiency in important brain healthy nutrients or an overabundance of things like sugar um, that are, are harmful for brain health. So when you said soda, obviously you're saying to the American term, which is, is sweet, what, what about um, carbonated drinks that aren't sweet, like, like just fizzy water? Fizzy water, fine. Um, artificially sweetened drinks, whilst at the moment they are still uh, generally recognised as, as safe, there is new, well, at the moment it's preclinical animal studies, and I think they're starting some human trials now in, I think, two sites. The concern about artificial sweeteners is that potentially, possibly, you know, and it's not, I don't, I don't want to start any... Um, kind of starting to cause the alarm. Um, but there's questions about what they might do to the gut microbiome. Um, and the gut microbiome is actually an important feature in modulating inflammation in the body. So that's there's a question there about what it might potentially do. Well, I think I read in the New Scientist this week um, that it varies hugely from person to person. And for some people, it may, it's really bad and other people it makes no difference at all but there's no way we can know which group we fit into is there really no certainly not yet um exactly so it's kind of at the moment as i say it's generally recognized as safe if you were being very prudent if you're quite anxious about this stuff you might want to limit your exposure to those foods and try to switch maybe to you know if you're very used to drinking um you know, fizzy drinks or sweetened or unsweetened, you know, maybe having a little bit of juice with fizzy water topped up or fizzy water with, um, you know, lemon or lime or something like a kombucha where the sugar is um, metabolized by the, the live bacteria. Um, so you get a fizzy flavored drink with a low sugar um, uh, level. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Um, um, another question from Anonymous. Uh, what's your opinion on supplements? particularly vitamins and multivitamins, are they effective? Um, it depends. Uh, so broadly, uh, supplements aren't useful if you don't have a deficiency. Um, so, in, and that, that's one of the big problems with um, RCTs of nutritional supplementation is that they don't, they often don't take into account people's baseline levels. Um, so if someone goes into a clinical trial with enough vitamin D, giving them a supplement, because often with supplements, we have a threshold level, which is the point at which if you've got enough, having more isn't going to help and isn't going to give you any cl clinical significance um, in whatever parameter you're studying. Um, but for people where there is deficiency, so this is, for example, in the prison studies, um, what they found was in a randomized controlled um, placebo controlled trial was that giving prisoners who had below uh, recommended daily amounts of all nutrients other than omega-6 fats, they, they are deficient in everything. 
um, giving them supplements, so vitamins, minerals, omega-3, reduced violence by on average by, by 30%. Wow. It's extraordinary. It's really extraordinary work. Um, so when there's deficiency, yes, supplementation has a role if it's not possible to get those nutrients in uh, through whole foods. And I guess on top of that, you know, special diet. So for example, for vegans, B12 and omega-3s, as I've said before, um, particularly for people, uh, vitamin D, I mean, and vitamin D is a recommendation basically for everyone from about now until April. And certainly for people with darker skins, uh, black and Asian people um, all year round at this latitude, because we're simply not going to be able to synthesize enough vitamin D um, from the sun. Um, and also that there is a, there's an epidemic of vitamin D deficiency in South Asians in the UK, um, especially if um, cult they're culturally vegetarian. Um, so again, so supplements for specific reasons, if there's a deficiency, have some efficacy. But if you're eating a balanced diet and you are getting, you know, your five to 10 a day, they might be insurance, they're probably not massively making a difference. So for most of us, if we're having a good diet, not to worry, maybe well, definitely vitamin D over the winter months. And if you've got darker skin, then all year. And otherwise, if you are worried that your diet is deficient, if you're worried that you're not able to eat as healthily as you'd like, then it's probably not a bad idea. Yeah, it's, it's kind of insurance, I guess. It's, it's never going to be as good as whole foods because there are plant nutrients, you know, thousands of them that haven't got names yet because we haven't recognised them. But, you know, it'll bridge a gap. OK, thank you. Um, another one from uh, Anonymous. Do you think that any part of the positive effect of walking comes from the brain processing the visual stimulus? So driving or watching TV might be good too. <laughs> um, oh, so, <laughs> <laughs> that's cheeky. Um, so there is some evidence that there's some aspect of just of movement across the visual field being valuable for us. And that some, for example, some aspect of, of claustrophobia claustrophobia is about the fact that we haven't we don't get much movement for the visual field in in small and enclosed spaces um but the rest of it is movement related <laughs> i'm afraid uh, and what's really interesting about walking is that even in in studies where people have been primed to not enjoy the walk so we'll get a group of people and say oh i'm sorry we're going to have to walk across campus um, we're going to go past some bins and there might be some rats they might, you know, you prime them to have a not very nice walk. Um, actually, people's uh, ratings of their mood are improved anyway, just through the, the process of walking. So there's, there seems to be something about just the, the physiology of walking, as well as the, the visual field stuff that uh, is beneficial for us. OK, thanks. Um, the next question comes from Greg, who's in L.A., well, multinational audience um <laughs> are you aware of any studies of the relationship of cannabis consumption to age-related <laughs> neurodegeneration asking for a friend <laughs> okay greg um no and you know i think so as uh, cannabis has been legalized uh, incrementally across various states in the US and, and, and across the world. I think there will be more research into uh, its use. We know, for example, with people with MS and, and other kind of movement and, and muscular disorders, um, it's beneficial there. Um, it's certainly not beneficial for anyone whose brain is still growing. Um, and so certainly neurologically, your brain is still considered adolescent. It's still myelinating up until about your mid twenties. Um, and uh, for those people who are at risk of things like schizophrenia, um, cannabis use, um, particularly very strong forms of cannabis are, are risky. They can kind of tip you over into first episode psychosis. Um, so I'm afraid as yet, I, I don't know of the evidence about uh, cannabis use and brain health long term. I will have a look though and see if there's anything there. And assuming that Greg, uh, Greg's friend, sorry, yes. is <laughs> over the age of 25, then um, 
and 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 is still healthy, then the, all the problems that you said for young people wouldn't necessarily apply anymore. Um, there so there would be less risk, but then it's all it's also always about genetic vulnerability meets the uh, environmental trigger. So you might be genetically vulnerable, but you're not having enough to you know you're not smoking frequently enough um, for it to tip you over, or there's not enough THC in it to tip you over, or so. <sighs> It's a very complex uh, picture, um, and I guess I would just want to be waiting for more research to to come out before we talk about that more generally. Okay, the scientist. <laughs> um, this question, I think you've answered, but maybe maybe uh, it's about vegan um, vegan diets again. But mm. there may be a specific answer you want to give, and that's what's the best vegan alternative to oily fish. Um, yeah in terms of these specific nutrients so in terms of protein you know as long as you're kind of combining legumes and uh, whole grains you should be able to get access to the f the full range of uh, essential amino acids um but in terms of these omega-3 fatty acids epa and dha it's really it's really a supplement it's um that algae based um source of dha um, I'll give you a day. That's what people. Yeah, are. I mean, you can supplement. You know, on top of that, making sure you're eating plenty of of nuts and seeds to supply ALA, which is important for brain health. Um, but we don't have any evidence. There are some, for example, there are some plant based uh, doctors who are saying once you cut out um, nutritional sources of EPA and DHA, your body upregulates its uh, translation of ALA into those fats. But A, we don't know how long that takes. And B, we don't know if you can produce enough um, simply because A, that, that work hasn't been done yet. And also because, as I said, because we've always had, um, certainly for large parts of our evolutionary development, these uh, ready sources of preformed DHA and EPA, that in the same way that we've lost the ability to, to make vitamin C because we, we have this plentiful um, supply of, of, of fresh fruit, um, we seem to have lost the at least the effectiveness of that conversion of ALA to EPA and DHA. And, and particularly, it drops off even further in older age. So I, I, I would be saying supplement probably um, to be on the safe side. Thanks. Um, you mentioned gum disease earlier and Anonymous asks, um, isn't there now a, a link between gum disease bacteria and Alzheimer's? Yes. Sure. Yes, there is. Um, and um, I, said, I talk about it in the book and it's, it was a lovely series of trials which demonstrated essentially um, kind of four things, which was um, that bacteria from the gum can make its way to the brain. Um, when it does that, it accumulates in the hippocampus um, and the, um, yeah, so the areas of the brain that are, are most uh, damaged by um, in Alzheimer's disease. Um, when you treat the gum disease in, in mouse trials, you re reduce the Alzheimer's symptoms. Um, and so, yes, there's certainly in these experimental studies. And what was really interesting is that for a long time, there's been the observation that um, people who have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease have very poor dentition, right? They, they, they tend to have a lot of gum disease and they had, uh, and, and have tooth loss. But the assumption was that if there was a relationship, it was because not having teeth means that you can't eat these nutritionally important foods, these crunchy vegetables that will provide you with these nutrients that support your brain health. Um, but actually it's looking more like that if you've got, a chronic infection, then potentially two things are happening. One is that you've got chronic inflammation, which is in, independently a driver of um, neuroinflammation, which is you know just bad news, but also that these bacteria can, or, or essentially the proteins they produce can cross into the brain and trigger inflammation independently um, as well. So yes, um, and, and I talk about that in more detail in the book. And so much of what you're saying is, um, it looks like we think probably. <laughs> I, yeah, so that, certainly, that's fair though, isn't it really? And certainly with this stuff. So with the the um, gum disease stuff, it was still in clinical trials, and we probably. You, you can't give people gum disease to prove that it will give them Alzheimer's. It's not massively ethical. Um, so 
we have to make that assumption that that translates. Um, and what we what they have seen, for example, though, is that um, we've identified the bacteria, the proteins formed by gum disease bacteria, they're called ginger panes from P. gingivitis. So P. gingivitis, as in gingivitis, a gum disease, they, they produce ginger panes, which are these inflammatory proteins. And those proteins have been found in 98% of brains of people with Alzheimer's disease. So the, the uh, mechanistic evidence, like the preclinical evidence in animals is there and the correlational evidence in humans is there. So we kind of were looking at and saying, look, it, it probably makes sense um, that this, at least for some people, might be a trigger or an exacerbator. And therefore, it's it's prudent to make sure that you're flossing, brushing your teeth regularly and visiting your dentist every six months. So even if we're not 100% sure, there's no, no loss. There's by no that. harm in brushing your teeth. <laughs> um. I'm going to pick. I'm, I'm going to be a bit bit naughty now because um, where's it gone? Oh, I've lost it. I, I, there's something that I thought was um, was really interesting now, and I'm I'm busy looking. Oh, I know. Uh, it's a bit further down the question list, but is there a link between deprivation status and dementia, Alzheimer's? Because um. De de like socioeconomic deprivation. So, yeah, so, so I mean, I suppose in, in many ways, people who, who may be less able to afford a decent diet or have time to exercise mm -hmm. or that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, broadly, yes. I mean, any marker of, of, of deprivation produces, produces health inequalities. Um, and particularly, for example, if we start, and I always like to start right at the beginning, um, with maternal health, for example, mothers who... Um, perhaps aren't able to afford, you know, um, pre-pregnancy um, pre supplements or nutrition or don't have the opportunities or live in food deserts, um, are, aren't going to be able to kind of take on the full complement of nutrients in, in order to start a healthy brain in, in, in their fetus, in their baby. Um, on top of that, the other midlife risk factors, that was one in one of the earlier slides, um, you know, type 2 diabetes, central adiposity, uh, metabolic syndrome, um, heart disease, high blood pressure, those things are again associated much more with deprivation or, or social inequality. So those risk, risk factors, you know, it's kind of two-step process. There's inequality, um, midlife risk factors, and, and then Alzheimer's on the other side. So uh, yes, yeah, as with uh, many health conditions, uh, social inequality is, is a big factor. Right. Um, I think we're probably coming towards the end now. Uh, this is why I'm, I'm scanning to... to... <laughs> oh, here's one I like. Um, it's, it's so short and it's so big. Happy gut, okay. happy brain? <laughs> um, I'm going to say broadly yes I mean you have to be very clear about what you mean by a happy gut but certainly one of the big important nutrients that I bang on about after omega-3 so after I've bored you to tears with omega-3 the next thing that I will just lecture you on is fiber um, and that's because again we're going back to that inflammation that that um, hyperactivated immune response and we know, for example, that you become slightly more inflamed every time that you eat. And that makes sense because um, the, the GI tract is the way that bacteria are most likely to get into your body through, you know, spoiled food or, or something like that. Um, so your body is always on guard when you eat in order to uh, be ready to attack anything that you might have taken in um, by a mistake. Um, so around 70 percent of your white blood cells, your immune cells are in and around the gut in order to take care of this, to protect this system. And your gut bacteria also teach your, your immune system what's friend, what's foe. And when that goes wrong, for example, is when you get allergies, right? Where there's a, a bit of mistaken identity between a peanut and something really, really dangerous. Um, so, I mean, there's a, there's a lot to talk about and I, and I do talk about it in more detail and, and on my, page if people want to come over to my Instagram page I talk about it as well um 
making sure you've got enough fiber so that your gut microbes don't get so hungry that they eat through your gut lining protection and turn on inflammation is really important. Really? I, I, so not get hungry. I thought getting hungry was good. No, your bacteria don't get hungry, oh, right? So your, your gut bacteria, I'll, I'll, I'll talk you through it. So your gut bacteria, so your, if this is your gut, um, your the tube of your gut, there's a little gel layer on the inside. Um, and that's your bacteria live on that gel layer. And that gel layer protects the lining of your gut. Um, so your bacteria love fiber. They, it's their favorite food. It's like Christmas every time you eat whole grains. They're having a fantastic time. Um, but if you eat a low fiber diet, so if you're not eating whole grains, brown rice, brown pasta, legumes, those sorts of things, then they don't have enough substrate. And then they turn to a backup fuel source. When they turn to that backup fuel source, it's called mucin, actually they start to eat that protective mucus layer. And when they do that, suddenly you've got a vulnerability in your gut wall. And as I say, you've got this immune system on this side, prepared to look after anything that comes in when you eat, meeting bacteria that shouldn't be there because there should be a protective gel layer. And then you've got inflammation. So you don't want your gut bacteria to get, to get hungry you want to always be providing them with fiber uh, as a fuel source so to protect that gut lining and reduce your risk of triggering inflammation. Right. Um, I think we've got time for one more question, which means that we don't have time for me to ask you what would be a real biggie that hasn't come up, uh, and that is about fasting. So what I will do is I will direct everybody to a chapter in your book specifically about fasting yeah. and the benefits of fast fasting. Is that fair enough? Yeah, that's fine. And the other thing I'd just like to ask you also before I ask you the last question is um, you, you mentioned your Instagram link. Uh, yes don't i didn't fight well i don't think we found that for the mods so i expect, expect people might like to hear that um yes yeah, at food and psych is me um and i've got um i do a whole bunch of series intro to neuroanatomy uh, where i talk you through you know the brain cell um uh, the uh, the synapse and then how things like b12 and omega-3 are important to the structure and function of the brain. So I will talk you through it. So it's like a little mini tutorial um, in my IGTV. So it's at Food and Psych. Brilliant, thank you very much for that. So coming on to um, the last question, which Dave J has asked. Um, I like this. If one food could help with brain health, what <laughs> food do you wish it was? Okay. Um, can I have a, a let on this? Because I've already banged on about omega-3s what do um, you wish it was <laughs> well the other one that um that it is and that um i really enjoy it being is berries actually um berries are actually berries ought to be considered a nootropic because they increase attention processing speed accuracy and performance on tests uh, within 90 minutes of consumption and they're delicious and you can put them in a crumble so uh, it's berries for me. I was thinking cake, but crumble's good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much indeed. That was really okay. interesting and informative. Um, there, this will be uh, available on YouTube shortly for people to come and watch again, because there's so much information you gave us that I think some people might want to listen again. If not, then um, head over to Kimberly's uh, Instagram page, which you now have or uh, buy her book, or, or go to her website, which uh, our mods can also give links to. So uh, a reminder for everybody, and I look at my notes here next week, we have James Ball talking about who really runs the internet. So that will be a good one to see you here next week for. And finally, we have, um, or nearly, penultimately, uh, we'll see you at the Lockins Razor. Um, I'm sure there are links going up in the chat. And finally, can we have a really big round of applause? Uh, very welcome. Thank you very much to Kimberly for a fascinating and um, really interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you. My absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me.